Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Meeting House, where we have conversation on religion and American life. I am your host, Dr. Dwight A. Moody. Thank you for stopping by today. Christian nationalism is in the news these days and on the campaign trail. Here we are in the middle of a campaign season. We're going to talk about it. Who better to guide our conversation than journalist Catherine Stewart, author of the book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of, Relig of Religious Nationalism. Many families and friends have rules about the dinner table. Maybe yours has rules like this. Don't talk about religion and don't talk about politics, especially at family gatherings. If you want to keep peace in the family, peace around the table. Both subjects, as we know, deal with things deeply important to many of us, our religion and our country. When they come together, one result is religious nationalism, and we're going to define this and describe it. We're going to talk about its emergence in our cultural moment. We want to discuss how it's impacting this election and also the immediate future of our country. Later, I'm going to have a few words about another controversial subject, Jerry Lee Lewis. But first, let's do the news. From Atlanta, Georgia, Last Sunday, black churches in Atlanta and throughout the South especially rallied their people for voting in a tradition known as souls to the polls. While out in Scottsdale, Arizona, a political rally for candidate for governor Kerry Lake, religion of a different source, took center stage. The event was sponsored by an organization known as Evangelicals for Kerry. Evangelical and Pentecostal pastors laid hands on the candidate lake and prayed over her and her campaign. From Hollywood, the video streaming service Hulu premiered a documentary about the fall of the House of Falwell. It is entitled God Forbid and carries the subtitle The Sex Scandal That Brought Down a Dynasty. Everywhere, small groups of Christians celebrated Reformation Day, commemorating the historic occasion of 1517 when the then Roman Catholic scholar Martin Luther posted on the church door a list of 95 ideas and practices he wished to debate. Today, almost 70% of Americans celebrate remnants of that religious holiday. We now call it Halloween and we spend more than $10 billion every year. And finally, from New York, my tribe, the Baptists, lost two influential leaders last week. First, the Hebrew scholar and pastor Ralph Elliott died in New York at the age of 97. He wrote a controversial book early in his career entitled The Message of Genesis. And also in New York City, Baptist preacher, pastor and university president Calvin Butts died at the age of 73. He was pastor of the historic and influential Abyssinian Baptist Church of Harlem and also president of the State University of New York at Old Westbury. I'd like to take a break, listen to the Sanctuary Choir of Abyssinian as they sing the old gospel song, I Didn't Hear Nobody Praying.
That's the choir at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem singing I Couldn't Hear Nobody Pray. They're having the funeral right this very minute on this Friday afternoon for their famous pastor, Dr. Calvin Budge. But you're in the meeting house where we have conversation on religion in American life. I'm your host, Dr. Dwight A. Moody. We're in our studios, WGGS 16, on the outskirts of Greenville, South Carolina. My guest today, journalist Catherine Stewart, author of the book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Welcome to the Meeting House. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you today. We're going to have a great conversation. <laughs> this is such a big, important subject. It is. And as you said earlier, religion and politics, it's a perfect storm. Uh, but I think that we really need to be having some of these impolite conversations because we can't really understand what's happening in our politics today, not just in America, but also around the world. All around the world. That's where I want to start, because in your book, page uh, 248, I want to read this to you. It calls itself a global conservative movement and claims that it seeks to defend the natural family. But it's really about taking down modern democracy and replacing it with authoritarian, faith-based, ethno-states. You could call it a kind of global holy war." End quote. Wow. And here we are in the middle of election season. Brazil, Italy, Israel, the United States, just to name a few. It's a global movement, isn't it? Well, sometimes I think religious nationalism is e easier to see when it's happening in other countries. Mm. When we see a leader like Vladimir Putin in Russia, or Erdogan in Turkey, um, or Viktor Orban in Hungary, when these leaders um, <clears throat> ally themselves, bind themselves very tightly with ultra-conservative religious figures in their own countries in order to consolidate a more authoritarian form of political power. We recognize that as religious nationalism. And what they're doing is that they're sort of bubble wrapping themselves in sanctimony, um, saying, you can't criticize me, you can't touch me, see I've got these holy men by my side. And we're seeing that from a lot of American politicians today. And what they really want is to um, guard themselves against any a democratic check on their power, investigation of their corruption. And uh, around the world, we see that this sort of exploitation of religion and religious nationalism, it, it doesn't lead to pure theocracies necessarily. It, it tends to lead to kleptocratic, authoritarian, uh, 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 often like quasi-dictatorships mm -hmm. or dictatorships where um, the leaders are very nepotistic and cronyistic. And unfortunately, we're seeing this kind of dynamic in our politics today. Here in the United States. Right. The first thing I noticed about your book when I saw it in the spring, your use of the word religious nationalism instead of Christian nationalism. And of course, this is obviously because it can happen in any religious tradition, can it? That's absolutely true. Um, even though there are nuances specific to different countries, I think that religious nationalist leaders uh, bear a lot of similarities. There's the um, scapegoating of an impure other, the sort of division between a pure and an impure. The clean and unclean goes right. back a long way in religion. That's true. And religion, uh, this sort of religious nationalism becomes a way of determining who properly belongs in the nation and who doesn't. You know, it makes me wonder, most religions themselves have an authoritarian structure. Um, it seems that certainly the, in Christianity, the Catholic Church has dominated for a long time, very top-down. Uh, Islam, we've seen that in recent years. Um, so there's a great deal in religion that gives itself to this authoritarianism, doesn't it? That's true. Um, there can be, but of course, every religion is very diverse. 
uh, American Christianity is extraordinarily diverse. So most American Christians reject the pol like politics of conquest and division that Christian nationalism, for instance, represents. Um, there are many uh, American Christians who use, anchor their commitment to social justice, the values of equality, uh, empathy, concern for the least of these in their faith, uh, just as there are others who exploit religion for politics and power. Is there any correlation uh, between the political tradition of a re religion and uh, this uh, eagerness for authoritarianism. Um, I know in the Protestant world, of course, which was birthed out of the priesthood of every believer, and uh, in many ways the separation of church and state, there might be a, kind of a support for a more democratic, but that's not necessarily true in all the religions of the world. Um, you know, different religions have very diverse origins. I think even in America, we see uh, long linkages between a more authoritarian interpretation of scripture, one that emphasizes strict obedience, um, hierarchies ordained by God, and others that are more social justice focused, more focused on equality. We certainly saw this in the debates around emancipation a lot of the Christian nationalists of today, you can see a through line to the pro-slavery theologians, people like uh, Dabney, Dabney and Thornwell, mm -hmm. who I, uh, da uh, Thornwell put it this way, around, when there was this debate around, uh, a sort of struggle around emancipation, he said the parties in this conflict, I'm gonna paraphrase a bit, a bit here, he said the parties in this conflict are between, you know, the godly uh, uh, forces of, you know, order and, uh, and, and sort of godless, uh, chaos, communist, uh, I'm paraphrasing again, but it was, um, it, you hear this kind of, he was, he was identifying uh, godlessness and chaos with the, those who are arguing for emancipation. And, and there were other pastors, uh, I've written about a dozen of them in Power Worshippers, who were arguing for emancipation from pulpits um, and yet, as Frederick Douglass said at the time, he said the parties in this conflict are, um, you know, the the uh, the, the five thousand dollar divines, the very well funded pastors and 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 priests. They were are on the side, he said, of the slaveholder, almost to a man. And it was those arguing from humble pulpits, the poor and the sort of disenfranchised, who are arguing for egalitarianism and for equality and for emancipation. You write a lot in your book about the role of money and power. Here it is, you're bringing it up in the abolition debate that it was the moneyed interest that wanted to keep the status quo and resisted the chaos that they said uh, abolition would bring, very similar to what we're, we're seeing now, moneyed interest, status quo, that's, a, that's absolutely true. This movement would be nowhere without a cadre of, um, of ultra-wealthy funders who are funneling huge amounts of money into this movement's infrastructure. And we can talk about that a little bit. But the consequences that we've seen is, are that the leaders of the movement are embracing what they often refer to as biblical economics, the kinds of policies that uh, favor the ultra-rich. Low taxes or no taxes for the ultra-rich, no regulation of the environment, minimal rights for the workforce, a kind of hollowing out of the functions of government that actually help people, public education, health care, and things like that. So, uh, you know, one of the ways we can discern that this is a political movement and not just about those culture wars that they're always feeding the rank and file is that the leaders, when they're talking to the, you know, to the rank and file, it's all abortion and same-sex marriage and the threats to the family, et cetera, those little culture war, uh, you know, those culture war issues that they're, that they're using to message people and get them to vote a certain way. But when they're talking in the spaces that they share and to their funders, they have a wide range of economic policy, social policy, and foreign policy positions 
and that shows that this is not just a, a culture war. We're engaged in a political war. Well, part of what you say is a pushback against government intrusion into our lives. We need to uh, have less government, um, more commerce, more independence over here. But at the same time, they're trying to seize the levers of power and control the government. Absolutely. They love government when they want to turn uh, non-sectarian public schools into religious schools. They love government when they want to ban a range of individual rights. So at the, at the same time, they're saying, we don't like government when it doesn't support us, but if we can get hold of government, by golly, we're going to use it and to further our interest. That's absolutely right. You're in the meeting house. I'm here talking with Catherine Stewart uh, about uh, her book, about what everybody's talking about these days, the power worshipers, the dangerous rise of religious nationalism. I'll be back in just a minute. Uh, here is Buffalo Springfield singing his song for what it's worth with the chorus, what's going down? That's what we're trying to figure out, what's going down, aren't we? We're trying to figure out. Enjoy this, I'll be back Something in just a minute. Here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down There's bad lines being drawn Nobody's right if everybody's wrong Young people speak in their minds Are getting so much resistance from behind the Time we stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down A field day for the heat A thousand people in the street Singing songs and a carrying signs Mostly say hooray for our side It's time we stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going on It will creep It starts when you're always afraid Step out of line The man come and take you away We better stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down We better stop Now, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Everybody look, what's going down? That's what we're trying to figure out here in the meeting house today. What's going down on the American political and religious front? I'm, I'm your host, Dwight A. Moody, talking with journalist Catherine Stewart about her new book. But I want to quote back to you something you wrote July the 5th, published in the New York Times. You had just attended a conference uh, re the annual Road to Majority Policy Conference. And this is what you wrote. At this year's event, which took place in June in Nashville, three clear trends were in evidence. The first, the rhetoric of violence among movement leaders appeared to have increased significantly from the already alarming levels I had observed in previous years. Although metaphors of battle are common enough in political gatherings, this year's rhetoric appeared more violent, more graphic, and more tightly focused on fellow Americans rather than on geopolitical foes. And here we are just a few days away from the attack on 
Mr. Pelosi. That's true. You know, that increasing language of demonization of the other, of, of um, dehumanization is becoming more common in those circles. And it's deeply alarming. Um, I heard Democrats refer to as demonic, satanic, um, basically inhuman. And I heard, have heard this from multiple speakers. I heard lots of references to, you know, put on your armor and r run to the sound of the guns. Uh, former President Trump gave a speech at that conference in which he said, the greatest th threat to our nation is not our foreign enemies, as dangerous as they may be. The greatest threat to our nation is the internal enemy within. And viewing fellow Americans, and frankly, the majority of the voting public, uh, if you look at what happened in 2016 and 2020, just in terms of straight majorities, as an internal enemy that has to be defeated at all costs is extraordinarily dangerous. But this is something the movement has done for some time. They have convinced their followers that they're an apocalyptic struggle mm -hmm. between absolute good mm -hmm. and absolute evil. Mm -hmm. And the consequences of loss in the po political arena are, are basically too um, dire to ignore, too, too dangerous to ignore. And that has primed many of the rank and file to engage in radical actions, uh, no matter how dangerous. I remember when all this got started, I'm old enough to remember Jerry Falwell Sr. and his, the launching of the culture wars. Just like you say, the use of the war imagery, I mean, you're right, the, the New Testament does some of that, but generally it's a spiritual battle. It's not against flesh and blood. Exactly. The Bible clearly says it's against spiritual demons and high places and that sort of thing. But here they've appropriated it, haven't they? Yes. To your neighbor. It sounds less and less <laughs> metaphorical and much more uh, applied to the here and now. And then you also have the development of a lot of uh, men's ministries where, again, these you know, men are being sort of told that the they... The macho. Exactly. There's a kind of militarism, a normalization of militaristic language that we're starting to see. And look, radical speech often precedes radical actions. We saw the consequences in the disgraceful attack on our capital of January 6th. The role of religion in that event, now that you've brought it up, uh, the flags, the Christian flag, uh, Trump is our president, uh, Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, people carrying Bibles, even the great uh, picture of the president holding up the Bible in front of the church. It was a signal to everybody, wasn't it? That's that true. We have religious justification, religious uh, warrant for uh, the violence. And of course, we've seen it. Absolutely. We've seen the violence, not just on the 6th, but down in Charleston, uh, at the, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, the Baptist Church down in uh, Sutherland Springs, Texas, all these places where people are coming into religious centers. That's true. I mean, on January 6th, a lot of the groups that stormed the Capitol were persuaded that uh, God was tr chose Trump. They'd been told that. I mean, many of the religious nationalist movement leaders like David Barton called Trump God's guy and said he was God's chosen leader. A, a biblical king like King Cyrus, an imperfect ruler through whom God chose to enact his will, but God's choice. So if the other guy wins, it must be against God's will. And that sort of primed them for those radical actions. But I think the uh, networks of uh, the movement played an underappreciated role right after Trump lost the 2020 election and started to, um, even before he lost, during the second debate with Joe Biden and started saying, well, I might not accept the results if I don't win. I'll only accept the results if I don't win. Stuff that, by the way, Carrie Lake is saying now, um, or she's saying some version of it. Um, a lot of the network you know, movement leaders uh, were spreading those election lies or giving sort of um, forced to those lies by um, expressing uh, con faux concern about irregularities. Um, I attended a gathering of a, a group called Faith Wins. They gather, they've gathered together 
hundreds of pastors across multiple states, actually probably thousands of pastors. I attended an event in Chantilly, Virginia, and the group included you know, David Barton, who was there to tell these pastors about America's founding as, a founding as a supposedly conservative Christian nation, Chad Connolly from the Council for National Policy, but they brought with them um, a, a so-called elections integrity specialist named Hogan Gidley, who was there to spread lies about the 2020 election and say, there were dead people voting, you all saw what happened in Arizona. This was after the Republican-led investigation in Arizona turned up nothing, and yet he's there spreading the word to these pastors that the election was stolen. And then, of course, they're giving them voter guides and messaging materials, sermon starters, all these materials to turn out their congregations. One of the things that's gotten not nearly enough attention, you mention it in your book, the new apostolic reformation, which is rooted in the Pentecostal tradition. And just like you said, uh, if you've got these prophets in the Pentecostal tradition that are predicting that Donald Trump would win in 2020, they predicted it for 2016 and surprisingly he won. And then they came back and predicted it for 2020. Well, if you've got God predicting things, just like you say, and then it doesn't happen, then somebody must have interfered with the purpose and plan of God. Exactly. And this gives powerful religious uh, authorization to, well, then there, it must have been stolen. It must have been stolen, absolutely. It must have been stolen. So when you've got politicians and religious leaders giving you reasons why it must have been stolen, uh, it's much easier to persuade a, a crowd. Um, and I think this thing about the role of these Pentecostal prophets is not known enough, it's not appreciated enough. Am I not right about this? You're absolutely right about that because even you're seeing that sort of spirit warrior yes, language. Absolutely. It's almost like a, a style or a, of language. You're seeing it transcend the Pentecostal world. You have people like Mike Flynn who's running those Reawaken America tours. He is working hand in glove with a lot of these uh, explicitly dominionist folks like Lance Wall now. Um, and he identifies as a Catholic. You have people like Doug Mastriano, who has been affiliated with the Mennonite Church. He's bringing a lot of new apostolic Reformation apostles to his gatherings and giving them voice. So you're seeing the kind of language of dominionism pervade this movement uh, in areas where, frankly, it would have been considered I think, heretical. I think that's an important point. You mentioned uh, coming out of the Catholic coming out of the Mennonite, two traditions for which this stuff is foreign, really. That's right. And um, it makes you wonder whether they're still connected to those traditions in any real way. Well, it shows that this is not about theology. This is really a movement that transcends and rep brings in representatives of a number of varieties of uh, both Protestant and non-Protestant religion, but really it's about uh, political, oh, it's really a political war. It's about the, you know, what unites them as a common political vision, which is deeply authoritarian. Where do you think this rhetoric and action, violent action is going to lead? Well, no one What can, are you expecting to happen? <laughs> no one can predict the future, but I think the consequences are too serious to ignore any longer. And I think for a long time, uh, a lot of folks really did ignore it and uh, at our peril, and it, we really have to grapple with the fact that we have um, uh, this kind of conspiracism and violent rhetoric that is, you know, have disproportionate influence in our politics today. Not only the violent rhetoric, which we hear and see, but the Action. arming yes. of the American population, a third of the American people own, have guns in their homes, and millions, are, millions of guns are being sold, not to the other two-thirds of the America, but these people are buying more and more guns, aren't they? That's true. That's true. And uh, uh, a lot of them have been sort of, I I'm hearing from people all the time, all around the country, and I'm just hearing a lot of 
stories here and there about um, militias that are being formed. And some parts of the country have been really, like if you look at parts of Idaho or Oregon, there's just a tremendous amount of uh, militia activity. Now, a lot of those militias groups, like the Oath Keepers, for instance, uh, or Proud Boys, were not, are starting to adopt religious nationalist yeah. language, mm. a sort of Christian nationalist identity, even as you know, this wasn't so important to those groups. Um, and one of the some things that I've been impressed with how many of these meetings you attend. Have you ever been to a militia meeting? I have not been to a oh, militia meeting. Oh, that's on your bucket list. <laughs> that's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> you need to find one of these militias and report on it, right? <laughs> Write something for for the, the, the New York Times about that. <laughs> Come back and talk to us about it. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do right now. We're going to get away from this uh, violent language and uh, this dangerous uh, talk and take a short ride on the beautiful Swamp Rabbit Trail. Do you know about the Swamp Rabbit Trail? I need to know about the Swamp You're, Rabbit we're Trail. Gonna, we're, I'm going to teach you something now that here you are in South Carolina. This is a, a momentary diversion from the ugliness and uncertainty of American <laughs> politics, okay? <laughs> Sounds great. That was the Swamp Rabbit Trail. I confess that I personally shot that video while riding my bike the 10 miles from my home up in uh, Traveler's Rest, right down to the epicenter of the trail, the falls of the Reedy River at the center of Greenville, South Carolina. My guest today in the meeting house, Catherine Stewart, have you ever been to Greenville? I have been to Greenville. Oh, have you and seen the falls? I have, well, you know what? I saw Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University, which really? Which was really spectacular, <laughs> um, seeing that art collection. Yes. That was it's really one wonderful. Of one of their most famous uh, claims to fame, I guess we That's should say. True. We're talking about religious nationalism, uh, the merger of uh, political ambition and religious rhetoric all over the world. Uh, a global holy war, you have called it. I think that's a very powerful, uh, a powerful statement. Yesterday, you were featured in the New York Times podcast called The Argument. One of the issues that came up was, what is a better way forward for religion and politics? We've, we're talking here about what we think is a toxic development, a dangerous development, not only in the United States, but around, around the world. But, uh, and I started the show today with two versions of this, with the, um, in Atlanta, uh, going to the polls, souls to the, uh, souls to the polls, and then out there in Arizona, the faith and freedom rallies, two different ways of of pouring our religious passion into uh, public events and political issues. How is this supposed to work, Catherine? <laughs> well, sometimes when we think about uh, religious nationalism, I think we should think about information bubbles because one of the things that religious nationalism does, it exploits religion for politics. So what they want to do is separate people from the facts. And today, unfortunately, a large subsection of Americans have been um, brought into a kind of a, a, a world of conspiracism. I think it's deeply alarming. There was a poll recently that said some 25 percent 
of Republicans believe in some of the tenets of QAnon. And you see it when you go to one of these Reawaken America tours, for instance. I want you to talk about that. You've well, been to those. Yes, I have. And it's very interesting. So I, you walk in, there are thousands of people. I spoke for about, you know, there's people in QAnon t-shirts and Wigwa t-shirts, and there are people who are talking about the great replacement conspiracy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are people who believe that the vaccines are meant to kill 80% of Americans and replace them. But the one conspiracy that they all believe, not everyone there believes in every conspiracy, and there's a lot of conspiracies flying around, um, a lot of medical misinformation. Mm -hmm. But then the one conspiracy that seems to unite them is the myth of the stolen election. And, uh, and this is frankly very dangerous, but movement leaders have sought and worked to separate people from the facts because that makes them easier to control. And it pr protects them from any real check on, on their own corruption and, and a, a closer look at what they're really doing. Now here we are, just a few days away from the midterm elections. There's already talk about um, irregularities in the voting. Hmm. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think the rhetoric, what turn is the rhetoric going to take after this midterm election? You know, unfortunately, I don't see this movement going away anytime soon. Um, the strength of the movement is in this dense organizational infrastructure that was built up over decades, really five decades. We're five decades, that, beginnings right. about 1970. This is when Jerry Falwell first started in the South. And um, Right, and with the rise of the new right, Paul Weyrich and Phyllis Schlafly, how they felt the Republican Party had become too soft on communism mm -hmm. and too liberal, and they wanted to sort of take it to the right. And at that point, they needed an issue that was going to unite their movement. And um, abortion wasn't the first issue. At the time that Roe versus Wade passed, as you know, most Protestant Republicans supported it. The Southern mm -hmm. Baptist Convention uh, supported the passage of Roe versus Wade. Um, and even uh, Billy Graham said, I believe in Planned Parenthood. Billy Graham said that. He could never get away with saying that now. And no. his son Franklin would never say that, would he? <laughs> no, no, uh, absolutely not. And uh, Barry Goldwater, that great conservative hero, his wife Peggy co-founded Planned Parenthood in Arizona. Isn't that That's amazing? That's my favorite little factoid. Um, but they needed an issue to unite their movement. And one of the things that was really upsetting to the very political pastors um, at that time was the fact that the Internal Revenue Service was starting to look at their racially segregated religious schools. Okay, now this is the first time race has come up in our conversation today. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be the last. It shouldn't because <laughs> I generally think that all of this was triggered not by abortion, but by the racial issues of the 1950s. Mm. Well, the into school integration. But you know, the movement has been uh, hostile to um, racial equality since the very beginning. Since Those the very beginning. Pro-slavery theologians, this idea of America as an authentically Christian nation, laws based on the Bible, hierarchies ordained by God. The, the, the racial piece of it today, you know, you're not going to have movement leaders like Tony Perkins um, or Ralph Reed by any means saying anything about, you know, that's pro-slavery or pro-segregation, but that I, those ideas between insider versus outsider, pure versus impure, those lines are patrolled with as much fury as ever. And even the pushback on public schools oh. is rooted in the racial issues and the integration issues, the federal government, 1957, going into Little Rock, sending the troops into Little Rock. Absolutely. And that was, let's not forget, people like Bob Jones said that segregation was God's established order. We're just a few miles, you know, from <laughs> where he said that, I'm sure, here at Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. And we're already looking for, looking forward to 2024. What do you think is going to happen? I can't predict, but um, what's very interesting to me is that I recently read that former President Trump and Ron DeSantis are having sort of competing rallies. 
But no matter who the Republican candidate is in 2024, no matter who the nominee is, um, you can be sure that that person will give this movement what they want in terms of power, access to public money, um, political access, the kinds of justices that they want, because this is a movement, the Christian nationalist movement, I'm talking about the you know, the organizational infrastructure, the right-wing policy groups, legal act advocacy groups, legislative initiatives, um, networking organizations. That functions as a giant voter turnout machine. And no Republican leader can really win at the national level without courting this movement and, and, and giving with them what they want. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question now in a very different uh, direction. We've talked about the global movement. We've talked about the American. Where do you see signs of hope around the globe? Where, where are there political movements or expressions of religious vitality that offer a different way forward, that are holding up a candle in this dark world we've been talking about? You know, I hear from pastors all the time who are opposed to this movement, opposed to the conspiracism and the hateful uh, language, the division, and really do not you know, reject the politics of conquest and division that the movement represents. I think we are the majority in this country. You know, we don't have the organizational infrastructure in a way built up over decades in the way that the religious right does, but we are the majority and we need to act like it. So that gives me hope. I think the hope is frankly in the struggle. There's a Reverend Kelly Brown Douglas, do you, do you know her? She heads Union Theological Seminary. She, she speaks about how the hope is in the struggle. She, she speaks of her ancestors who were enslaved and they um, fought for freedom even though they knew they would never experience freedom themselves. They fought for people they would never see and they should be our heroes. They, we should, we should be like that. And, and, and no, there's no quick fix. You know, this is going to be a kind of a, a generational struggle. But, but there is hope and, and joy in the struggle as well. You know, you, we end up here talking about the racial dynamics here. And everywhere around the world where this global holy war is going on, there's a racial dynamic to it. Much of it generated by uh, immigration and refugees who are challenging the uh, established uh, identities and religions of places all around the world. And here we are, you've quoted a, a, a black leader harking back to um, the struggle for freedom and ab abolition. Isn't it ironic that the very integration and equality movement in our country, which started about 70 years ago, uh, lit the fire of this global holy war, you call it, but may also be uh, the bright and shining light of a way forward for the rest of us who are, who are looking for examples and inspiration. We can find it in the very people that have been demonized by this global holy war. That's beautifully put. Well, I'll tell you what's going to be beautiful. Uh, I want to play now for everybody uh, a rendition of the great song we shall overcome this is the morehouse college choir singing the great song we shall overcome
That was the college choir at Morehouse College singing that great piece, We Shall Overcome. Gives me hope just to listen to it. We've been talking about Christian nationalism today, and this is very much on my mind, but I've got something else on my mind today. Jerry Lee Lewis. He died last week. I did not list his death among my news of religion in America. If this broadcast were about music and culture primarily, yes, I would have. But religion, not so much. Jerry Lee had a contested connection with religion. In that regard, he was like his talented contemporaries, Elvis Presley and Little Richard. All three grew up in Southern gospel music, and it created a tension deep in their souls. It's as if there was a tussle, a tug of war between the sounds of gospel and the even deeper soul of the beat, the drama, the exhilaration of music, not just any music, but rock and roll. Jerry Lee and Elvis and Little Richard, all three of them wrestled with this tension this pull to the right and pull to the left, the Christ-haunted South, one writer called it. They were firmly entrenched in this double-sided addiction. They wrestled with how to give voice to the one and also to the other. Quote, I don't know whether my sinful indulgence in the music of the devil will condemn me to eternal hell, Jerry Lee said in 1986. I fear it will, yet I never have been able to stop myself, end quote. This struggle is not just about music and not limited to these three men. Many people, including myself, who grew up in Southern conservative religion, have struggled to balance that inherited faith with the realities, say, of science or biblical scholarship or world religions or even politics. It's not easy to remain loyal to the one while embracing the other. We want to affirm both, the old way and the new way. It's a struggle, I can testify. It certainly was for Jerry Lee Lewis. He loved singing gospel hymns and frequently spoke a gospel word. But on the other hand, one writer described him as a drunk, a liar, a cheat, and a murderer. I want to conclude the show today with a little bit of Jerry Lee, performing in 1983 in London his fabulous and talented rendition of this old gospel song, Life's Railway to Heaven, with its repetitive chorus, quote, Blessed Savior, thou wilt guide us till we reach the blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in thy praise forevermore. Let's take a listen. We must make the run successful From the cradle straight to the grave Give it a watch to be Never fall, dude Boy, you better never fail just keep your hand up on that throttle and your eyes up on the rail. Hey, blessed Savior, surely thou will guide us till we reach the blissful shore.
That is Jerry Lee Lewis who died this past week at the age of 87. I'm Dwight A. Moody, very much alive, your host in the Meeting House this week. Thank you for joining our conversation on religion and American life. And thank you, Catherine Stewart. Thank you so much for having me. This is a terrific conversation. It's been really great. I appreciate your book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Write another book for us. <laughs> and, Will do. And come back to the meeting house where we okay. can have more conversation on religion and American life. Thanks all of you for joining our conversation today. Visit the website at themeetinghouse.net. There are a lot of commentaries, a lot of podcasts, a lot of book reviews, and a place where you can donate to the meeting house to keep us on the air. God's blessing to all of you. Join us next week for another conversation on religion and American life. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House.